Uh, just to let you know, what I just handed back was a printout of some people's term papers. I'm working on it. Uh, so uh, for this class, because there's um, an important writing component, I'm printing them out and I'm writing uh, uh, comments on uh, your grammar, spelling and such on the paper. And then um, How did you I am uh, giving you comments on the content in Canvas, all right? So uh, if, uh, if you guys, hello folks, we're starting now. Is it solo, right? Yeah, yeah you're solo, there's yours. And could you guys just write your names on the attendance list now? We're not calling roll anymore. So uh, let me repeat that. Uh, I actually put about five minutes into every comment I put on Canvas. So I really hope that you guys look on Canvas for what I say about content. But it is incredibly painstaking to try to mark up an essay online for just basic grammar and spelling. So uh, I, I don't do it because uh, so I do it on paper and I give it back to you. That's, that's the best I can do. So if I haven't given it to you yet, um, I'm working on it this week. So you'll get yours back, I hope, unless some other stuff falls on me. Uh, I've been working on the, uh, I've been working on the quiz. So uh, we know that there is a quiz next class here. Uh, I would appreciate it if streamers came in to write the quiz, but if you can't, you can make arrangements with me. Uh, this was in the syllabus. You were not required to come in for a quiz. You are required to come in for the midterm and the final. So uh, if, uh, again, I would prefer to see people for the quiz because it gives me an idea that you're still with us in the class. And I do like to know who's in the class. <laughs> so uh, do come in for the quiz next class. Uh, and we will review for it at the end of this class. I'm leaving about a half hour at the end of this class to. Uh, to review for the quiz, okay? In addition to that, we're looking forward to the first uh, research term paper on uh, September 26. So that is a couple weeks away. Uh, there are four assigned topics. You pick one of them. We've talked about two of those topics, uh, which were largely devoted to radio. The other two topics coming up are devoted to television. So as I said, you pick one of those. Uh, your primary research source for this essay is the textbook. You need to make contact with a textbook. When I read your essay, the first thing I see is, oh, so-and-so wants to write about how radio created a national culture. Uh, they need facts in order to support their argument that a national culture came about. The first place for facts is the textbook. Uh, so I should see everybody using the textbook as, as extensively as they can. The textbook, as you saw, condenses everything incredibly tightly. So you may find that you want to write about something and there's just a line or two in the textbook. Then I'd say go out and look for secondary sources. And we should talk about that within the next uh, two classes, I guess, as to you know just some guidelines about secondary sources. But primarily with the textbook, you're good enough. Maybe that's all you need. It depends on how you construct your, your essay and your argument. Um, so we'll definitely t set some time aside uh, next week to talk about sources, to talk about what you know, a thesis or an argument is, and just a little bit about academic structure in an essay. It may be familiar to some people, it may not be. So we'll see on this first research paper how that goes. So, any questions about those three things? Okay, good, great. Um, well, actually, I had a question. Yeah. The quiz, is it going to be uh, chapters one and two, chapters one, two, three? One, two, and three. And um, there's, uh, uh, like I said, we're going to review for it uh, at the end of class today. And um, just looking over here, rather than the syllabus, let's look on the home page. And you will find right there um, the essential information covers chapter one, two, part of chapter three, 30 minutes. And here's a YouTube of the compilation of slides, which are all, uh, they have all the answers on them, basically. So uh, there's a, a from the presentations on chapters one, two, and three, 
I've extracted the important slides. I've put them in a video there that you can watch. That video will stay up until just before the exam quiz, I mean. So uh, the other thing is, um, as you noticed, again, there's a massive detail in the textbook, which is impossible to convey in the classroom. That's why they write that stuff down. I try to uh, either bring up the stuff that I think we might enjoy talking about, or bring up what I feel is the essential information out of the textbook. We're not going to cover everything in each chapter. We got to stay on schedule. So if there's stuff that I left out about radio, which inevitably happens because I can't cover everything in the textbook, read the chapter. You're supposed to read the chapter anyway. And uh, uh, you know that level of detail is worthwhile for your research essays, right? So that the textbook can serve as a primary source of information for a, a research paper, but there's too much detail in there just to convey in the classroom. So that's why we move on uh, rather than just try to, you know, stick with radio until three weeks from now, we finally satisfied we've done a decent job on it. All righty. Television arises in the North America in the context of radio, right? Radio is a dominant medium starting from the mid 20s uh, all the way through until 1950 about. So radio has almost a 30 year stretch of being the, when I say dominant medium, I mean the one that everybody knows about and uses. You know, and we saw that explosive curve of people buying radio receivers and stuff. Uh, television goes back uh, um, to, uh, to, the, to the early 20s as well, um, as people were thinking about, well, if we can put radio over the uh, radio waves, let's say, can we also get images to go over the radio waves? And so there was a, a, a series of attempts to do this. In England, John Logie Baird had a primitive mechanical system. Uh, and I'll show you in a video in a second, which has some of these uh, uh, you know, images of what it was. Very, very crude. So that was the type of the best thing you could possibly get out of it. That was Felix the Cat, OK? <laughs> uh, and when actors, you should see what actors had to do in order to appear on this thing. So, it didn't work. It also made a heck of a lot of noise because it was mechanical. It was like all kinds of whirring, moving parts within it. So what was needed was an electronic version. Uh, and uh, we had a couple of uh, inventors who battled it out, just like we saw Armstrong and DeForest uh, battling it out with, uh, you know, RCA. Uh, David Sarnoff, right, was an original uh, uh, supporter of Armstrong. Um, licensed the technology, but eventually wound up uh, suppressing Armstrong's brilliant invention of FM, right? Uh, well, over here we had a couple of folks. We had uh, Vladimir Z uh, Zworkin, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, who uh, was uh, pretty much Sarnoff's boy by the end of it. He worked for Westinghouse Labs, which was tightly connected to uh, uh, RCA at that time. Remember, they had all kind of divvied up the broadcast industry so that uh, Westinghouse and RCA would make the hardware and uh, you know NBC and CBS would create the software, the, the programs. AT&T would carry the signals over their long distance lines and also had you know their hand in any money being made out of what they called toll broadcasting. So they, they'd carefully divvied it up. But there was an outsider named Philo T. Farnsworth. What a name. Working here, Philo T. Farnsworth, uh, working here uh, in, uh, in California anyway, for a time in the Bay Area, for a time in Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, Far Farnsworth licensed certain patents. And so there is uh, generally Zworkin and Farnsworth are credited as you know the inventors of the electronic television system which debuted at the world's fair in 39 finally so there's a, a little video that we could watch quickly uh, which will show some of this uh, stuff to us some of this is kind of fun we'll probably have to stop eventually and i can't hear there we go. wait did you ever wonder how all this happened how you can turn that knob and enjoy a dramatic show laugh at a comedian, watch the ball game, or hear and see news from anywhere in the world? Well, it's quite a story, the story of television. At the beginning, there were all kinds of different names for what we now call television. Some people called it radio vision, or uh, the telephonoscope, or audio vision, or hear listening. 
Um, the name that finally stuck, of course, is television, although not everyone liked that. The editor of the Manchester Guardian in England said uh, television, the, the word is half Greek and half Latin. No good will come of it. What is the origin of that no good technology that sits in our living rooms? The smooth electronic picture you're watching right now. Was it invented by an Idaho farm boy, a Russian immigrant, or a Scottish inventor named John Logie Baird? This is a 1930 Baird televisor. This was the first mass-produced television for the British television market. Uh, essentially the first commercially available television for the average person to, to afford. You could buy this unit with a cabinet on it with a nice bronze plaque on the front for about 25 pounds. Baird's televisor, invented in 1929, looked radically different from the electronic tubes of modern television. Instead, his was a mechanical system made up of rapidly spinning, rotating parts. In Baird's mechanical television, light from a subject hit a spinning disc, breaking it into pieces. Each piece of light hit a photoelectric cell, which converted the light into electricity. A bright piece generated a lot of electricity, a dark piece a little. The changing electricity was sent to a receiver, causing a neon bulb to rapidly flicker bright or dark for each bit of the picture. A receiving disc, spinning at the same speed as the first, put the light and dark pieces back together, like a jigsaw puzzle. Early television was a hit in 1925, when John Logie Baird displayed primitive images at a London department store. But when he applied for the first broadcast license ever, the BBC was nervous. Well, there were, there were two grounds to be afraid of television. One of them was the fear that it would uh, damage the morals of the populace. The other fear of television was uh, much more irrational, and that was the thought that if you had a television set in your house, uh, the BBC could see what you were doing. And uh, there was one woman who was afraid that the television set would be able to see through the bathroom wall, and she wrote a letter to the paper to this effect. But the, these fears have proved groundless. Mechanical TV did have real pitfalls. To show up on the screen, the actors had to wear bright blue paint to accentuate the eyebrows and lips. And the discs could never spin fast enough to create fluid motion. The images would always remain flickery and smudged. This Felix the Cat, the first ever cartoon character broadcast, was as good as it got. Baird's system never did catch on. Though a remarkable achievement, mechanical TV is now just a footnote in history. But even as Baird's idea failed, a new electronic vision was being born. The summer of 1921 found Philo T. Farnsworth in a sugar beet field in Rigby, Idaho, dreaming of trapping light in an empty jar and sending it one line at a time with a beam of electrons. So we'll pretend that we've got a, an illustration here of Farnsworth's beet field from the summer of 1921. And we find him tracing the rows across the beet field on his disc harrow, one row after another, monotonously into the afternoon. And then he reaches a point, he looks back behind him, and he sees these rows in the dirt. And at that moment, he realizes how he can use electrons to trace a TV image. And this is exactly how TV is rendered on your screen today, one line at a time, 525 lines per frame, 30 frames per second, just the way Philo Farnsworth envisioned it on the back of a disc harrow in the summer of 1921. What 14-year-old Farnsworth realized with his tractor was that a beam of electrons could paint a picture finer and faster than a spinning disc and it could be done with a cathode ray tube. A cathode ray tube is a glass tube with the, all the air pumped out of it. But it was discovered uh, that if you ran electricity through one end, through a filament at one end of this vacuum tube, that uh, electrons would flow from one end to the other. And that's when you have a cathode ray tube. That's called the cathode ray, that ray of electrons. Farnsworth's electronic television worked on the same principle as mechanical television, but instead of spinning discs, it used cathode ray tubes. The cathode ray tube fired electricity one pixel at a time, causing a special coating on the tube to glow. 
A lot of electricity created a bright spot. A little electricity, a dark spot. The cathode ray tube could paint a picture in a thirtieth of a second, fast enough to create fluid motion. In 1926, with twenty-five thousand dollars in private funding, Farnsworth set up a lab in San Francisco to try to turn his beat field vision into reality. In this age, when when they were beginning to develop electronic television, it's sort of analogous <coughs> to wanting to. There's a little dropout here. But it comes back. But uh, there were always very high voltages present that could uh, give somebody a tremendous shock. And there's some stories about people in the lab gang uh, getting potassium in their eyes and, and uh, having their eyesight threatened. Farnsworth was nearing success, but he had a rival, the brilliant Russian engineer Vladimir Zworkin. As early as 1923, Zworkin had submitted a patent for his own television system, but it was denied because it didn't quite work. He was now trying to perfect his system for the radio giant RCA and their visionary president, David Sarnoff, who saw television's future. Well, I think one of the great uh, marriages in uh, 20th century science, if you will, was the relationship between uh, Dr. Zhorkin and David Sarnoff. Sarnoff was like this great monopoly master buying up all the hotels on the boardwalk and he didn't want to pay anyone. He wanted to have total patent control over television. And uh, he was hoping Zvorkin would do that for him. But Farnsworth was ahead of them and had some patents from 1927, 1928. Zvorkin is given instructions to visit Farnsworth's lab in 1930. And Farnsworth does not know that Zworkin is actually working for RCA because he comes from the Westinghouse labs. So Farnsworth is very forthcoming, believing that he has met a fe fellow traveler on this new frontier. He is entirely forthcoming and shows him virtually everything that he has developed in the last three or four years in San Francisco. And he shows Zworkin the finished image dissector tube, and Zworkin holds it in his hand. And there are many eyewitnesses to, that heard him say, this is a beautiful instrument. I wish that I had invented it. Whether Zworkin actually stole Farnsworth's design is unclear. But shortly after his visit, he finally had an electronic camera tube that worked. It even made a brighter picture than Farnsworth's. Under a quirk of patent law, he was able to submit his new system under the original 1923 patent. Meanwhile, Farnsworth had also been successful with his camera and receiver. The key to both men's success? The cathode ray tube, which is why we still call television the tube. But who got there first? The corporate spy or the Idaho farm boy with the beat field vision? Claim 15 in Farnsworth's patent 1773-980 proves that Farnsworth is truly the father of electronic television. Schwarkin is the father of television. There is no doubt about that. I mean, it is filed in the U.S. Patent Office in the late uh, fall of 1923. The first patent of, uh, of, uh, of an electronic uh, television uh, tube. He is the father of television. It was up to the courts to decide. The patent battle raged for years. And the final decision? The father of the modern television... Philo Farnsworth. It was a big victory for Farnsworth and certainly a great defeat for RCA. David, David Sarnoff couldn't have been happy about this. It meant they were going to have to pay royalties. So patent control for electronic television belonged to Farnsworth. But the problem is he may have done it too early. He got his first patents in 1927. And by the time television got going commercially after the war, because World War II delayed things for five years, uh, many of his patents had expired. So he was not, no longer receiving royalties for it, and RCA had taken over the manufacturing of television sets, and Farnsworth just got left in the cold. Farnsworth may have won in court, but he lost in the marketplace. Today, we all know his invention, but we barely know the name Philo Farnsworth. And what would the rival inventors think of what's become of television? There's one very interesting story. Um, about work and I believe it was in Canada in 1954 when some Canadian reporter asked him what his favorite thing was on television 
And he always had a very um, pronounced Russian accent to the end of his life. He said, das fitch. And the man said, I beg your pardon. He said, das fitch, to turn the damn thing off. <laughs> he was... Um, he was very saddened that television didn't realize its potential. But in July of 1969, Farnsworth and his wife sat in their home in Salt Lake City, and they watched Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon. And he turned to his wife and he said, this has made it all worthwhile. So that's the story about inventors inventing television. Any thoughts on that? Any, any parallels you see with the uh, radio or other ideas? Arms. Lots of court issues. Court issues, yeah, absolutely. Everyone wants to have credit for Samsung getting it. Samsung and Apple. Yes, John? Yeah, lots of uh, overlapping patents and inventions kind of complementing each other. Right, and just the courts having to figure out whether, you know, who actually claims what. And then, and then and the business people angling to you know, regardless of who actually has the patents, trying to scoop up all the patents they can in order to own the thing outright, you know, and again, yeah? How they said, was, was it the farm boy or was it the corporate spy? I know, it's a, it seems a little biased there. There are, there are a lot of Zorkin uh, supporters who, who would argue differently, it's true. So also controversy about who's the first, and the other thing is as soon as you dig into it, you find that any medium, the beginning of the medium, is a kind of a cumulative thing. You know, Armstrong with FM was a was a uh, uh, you know an outlier that the guy could single-handedly create a whole system and finance its prototyping and basically be ready and then be screwed by Sarnoff later on. Uh, that's an exception. Usually, it's everyone's chipping in and fighting with each other about who's going to claim credit and get the money for it. Yeah, but you know, have you guys heard of patent trolls as well, right? The, uh, the, the, all the big tech co companies like Apple or Samsung are plagued by, uh, uh, by basically people who say they have a claim to, you know, the certain part of the cell phone or something, and they're constantly attacking them in court uh, in order to, you know, try, try to, you know, basically get pieces. So, so, so the, uh, you know, that's still going on today. Patent trolls who maybe don't have much of a claim, but, or maybe they do. I don't know. I, I'm not a judge. But one thing you do see is the Googles of the world buying up Motorola, not because Motorola has a great phone or anything like that, but because Motorola has some patents that if somebody else got them, maybe they could troll Google and attack them, basically. So, so you see a certain amount of corporate activity to, to limit that, that type of, of, of issue. So there would be a, a nice contemporary, uh, um, you know, uh, thing going on. Television is so influential once it finally gets going that uh, it's, it's definitely important stuff. What we can see here, um, Sarnoff rolls out RCA's television at the 1939 World's Fair. It works. There's only, you know, uh, a limited number of sets in Manhattan that could actually get the broadcast. But that was where they rolled it out. And that, that, that was that, you know, futuristic World's Fair that you see pictures of in, in New Jersey. And there's still some parts of it there. It was all kind of like looking at it, very futuristic, you know. Um, and TV was, was, in that context, you know, the, the medium of the future. But World War II put the brake on the rollout because, you know, uh, uh, that technology was put out. You, you know, that technology was, was basically... Uh, you know, we can't we can't produce this because we got to produce radar and stuff. Jonathan, were you saying radio? Is I was saying like it's 1939. Yeah, a lot of a lot of stuff happens. That's what. You, oh my God, the world was so like uh, we think we got <laughs> craziness now. I mean, world wars and such. So um, there's a hiatus during the Second World War when the war was over and you know American society uh, you know recovered from that incredible push that they'd put on. Yes, uh, television started to be uh, sold. Um, few stations, technological challenges. The main one I would say is that you couldn't record a show, basically. You'd have to, you'd have to actually make a film of the show off of the tube. So film the tube, develop the film, and then you could send it out west and you could broadcast that show uh, on the West Coast, if you want it. So, some of those problems there. Um, 
And the people who were adopting early on were other media corporations, you know, uh, newspapers and radio broadcasters, especially. Obviously, we saw how Sarnoff and RCA were, uh, you know, extremely competitive about this. We'd see a little bit later on CBS, right, uh, which was under Paley. So remember, Sarnoff, RCA, their network was NBC, right? And then CBS was also developing a, uh, a color television standard, uh, which was the first to get out there as well, but didn't survive. <coughs> Sarnoff also managed to, uh, to uh, get the upper hand in that too when it came to color TV. Um, so everyone understood the economics of, of, of networking at that point because radio had already paved the way and by, by the time television came out, you had, you know, um, you had CBS, you had NBC with uh, two networks, the red and the blue, which Congress eventually obliged them to divest because they said, well, you got too much power. Uh, so one of those, I believe it was the blue, I think, became MB ABC. So you had CBS, NBC, ABC uh, as, as your, your big networks, all of whom jumped into um, television production as well. No videotape, so things were live broadcast largely. So you had plays as content, you had plays, you had sporting events, uh, you had uh, um, uh, news, it starts to be done that way as well, right? So now in terms, of, uh, in terms of the regulator, so we know that the FCC existed from the 30s and their business was largely to, uh, to license radio stations and, and make sure that uh, you know, a, a, a relatively organized uh, technological playing field uh, was there for the big corporations to, uh, to, to profit from. Um, in this case, they get going into television and uh, they initially started granting licenses, but had to put a freeze on because there were so many requests for licenses that they realized that they wouldn't have enough uh, frequency uh, to, to go around. So what they did is they, they uh, had a, a four-year hiatus where they froze the licensing. So some original licensees like KGO, KCBS, uh, I'm not sure what the NBC station was here. Those were pre-freeze. And so you had a few lucky uh, licensees who had TV stations, basically with a very limited competition for the next four years as the FCC worked it out. So that was a gold mine for Hearst and for the others who, so that would have been Cron, right? K-R-O-N, I guess that would have been Hearst. Uh, they, they must have been the NBC affiliate here. They were, definitely. They were, yeah. So JP, are you, are you pulling on your knowledge of, of like basically what Cron was in 2000, kind of? Because you're right, and that, that just shows you that for you know, 50 years those affiliations were solid. You know, that Cron would have been around as an NBC affiliate for like 50 years. Pretty incredible. Um, so uh, the reason for the freeze was as the FCC worked out, okay, how many channels can we actually create in each local geographic area? So they go two, thir two through 13 in uh, the, uh, now let's see, the VHF. That would have been the VHF um, um, band. So right, we're talking about bands of frequencies that are, you know, uh, that you can broadcast on. So some of those, you'd, they'd, they'd set aside radio frequencies for point-to-point -point emergency stuff. They'd set aside radio broadcast frequencies, and they'd also set aside television broadcast frequencies. And when they realized that there would be more applicants than they actually had radio spectrum to distribute or television spectrum to distribute, they opened up a higher band of frequencies, the UHF band. And does anybody uh, have seen an old TV or maybe remember like being with relatives or something where there was one channel that would click, 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 two to 13, and then the UHF was kind of like, you just, you just spin it and have to try to tune. I don't know, Mason, do you, you remember? My grandparents had a, they had one of those. Uh, you know, counter sets with the TV in it and you know, all their stuff on top of it. Okay. All those, a couple of dials. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I had when we were growing up, black and white set. So UHF uh, was pretty bad quality, and, and you were always kind of tuning it a little bit like that. Yeah, it was, uh, however, you know, that opened up uh, to sort of um, uh, 
secondary players in the local markets. So your two to 13, your VHF with good quality would go to you know, ABC, CBS, NBC, whoever could get on early enough into that band. And then anyone else who wanted to come in would come in later on the UHF band. It wasn't as good. Yeah. It kind of turned into the antennas, right? So you would have the bat here, but then it kind of just turned into the... It actually, you, you needed two different types of antennas for that. Yeah. So they'd, they'd have different shapes. And you never really, you're just messing with it the whole time until... Right, yeah, yeah. UHF definitely wasn't as solid. Yeah, because the, frequ the frequencies were higher and it, they simply didn't receive so well. Yeah, you know, it's, it's another thing like what you may have noticed, AM, AM frequencies on radio travel way further. Uh, because they're lower frequencies, they're, they're longer waves, and they reflect off the atmosphere in a different way. Those high frequencies, FM has relatively high frequencies, but not as easy to broadcast there. Uh, look at that. In 62, the FCC mandates that everybody, every receiver has to have VHF and UHF. So that's always a problem. You can create a new standard, but can you get private industry to jump on board with a standard? You know, and again, I'd say current parallels, when we switched over from analog TV to digital high definition TV in 2009, that was a transition of several, like maybe close to a decade of planning and prepping and, and the FCC saying, we're going to force you all to change. And uh, that's, that's difficult to engineer. That's why we haven't turned to digital radio, because all of those private you know, companies have to be convinced to change. And the FCC you know, I, I think with reason doesn't necessarily intervene, you know, to, to tell everybody in the industry, you got to change. It's a, uh, it's a major kind of power play, right? If, if you're a broadcaster and someone just comes in and says, got to change, get a million bucks from the bank because we say so. It's like, wow. So, so you don't do that too often, but uh, they did it to support VHF and UHF. They did it also, well, in radio, there's some similarities, but we don't need to go there. Educational, 242 channels, that would be across the nation, reserved for educational television as well. So uh, that, that was a, um, a possibility. And we're talking, especially in the 1960s, this became, they actually started to use all this allocation for educational TV. I guess we'll get there. Uh, so, Color TV, do we have a date on Color TV? That's funny that they wouldn't give us a date. Um, I don't even want to weigh in on exactly when Color TV would have come up, but we could look it up easily. Right. Anyone, like anyone wants to? Pardon me? Like the late 60s, right? Something. I mean, it, we're, we, we want to distinguish between when the, when, the, when the standard was there and when it actually rolled out. But I would agree, because again, I grew up. I grew up in the '60s with black and white, but at that point, you know, it was disseminating. So maybe the late '50s, maybe the early '60s. I would say um, we could check that date. Main thing was CBS actually came up with uh, their the system first, uh, which beat RCA, right? But unfortunately, CBS's system was not compatible with the early black and white. Uh, the early black and white was based on something called NTSC. Uh, again, I don't know what that's an acronym for, but it's an acronym for the governing body of engineers who came up with the standard. National Television Society. I'm not sure. We can look that up too. We can look that up too, but it would it would break it would break the flow. So two things I have to come back to you with. So however, black and white was based on NTSC. And uh, um, RCA engineers came up with a system which was uh, compatible with the black and white. So basically, you could start broadcasting in color on the RCA system, and people with black and white TV sets could pick up your signal and see your program, and just they saw it in black and white because they had a black and white TV. But those who got color TVs could get the same broadcast and see it in color versus the CBS version, which required you to chuck your black and white uh, because it couldn't get your, the color broadcast. So clearly the NTSC version that RCA came up with, the NTSC compatible version, was the one to go with because you didn't require everybody who had a black and white TV to throw it away. So there was a slow dissemination of the color TVs into, you know, as people got rid of their old TVs, they go for color. So that was it. We're still talking, by the way, analog television uh, and standard definition 
um, which, uh, you know, that was in place. The NTSC color standard was in place until 2009 when we switched over to high definition. So it was there for a long time. And frankly, it looks pretty awful now when you look at it compared to, to you know, digital high definition TV. Oh my God. Uh, so yeah, networks were already in place. The radio networks were already there. So when television came in, it was sort of like this. They just, uh, how could I put it? it rather than risk uh, opening the field up to any more competitors, they tried to, you know, sew it up right from the start with, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, controlling TV programming and using all the hits from the radio to, uh, uh, to promote the television. So if you liked Bing Crosby, you know, he'd be on television specials. Uh, you know, if you liked uh, some of the early television uh, radio programs, Dragnet moved over to TV. Uh, the horribly racist Amos and Andy moved over onto TV, right? You've all heard, um, it, if you haven't heard about it, it's, uh, it's, it's shocking to actually see what people, you know, used to watch. Uh, so it came over from radio uh, to, to TV. Um, and, you know, the early licensees, like we said here in San Francisco, it would have been CBS, ABC, NBC. So they had that four-year period to just consolidate their hold on the new medium while nobody else could uh, apply for a, for a license, you know. So it, was, uh, it definitely uh, cemented things in. Now, Dumont was uh, an interesting fourth network there. Dumont did everything from uh, um, manufacturing cameras and television sets to actually producing the programming that would go on them. So they were a real kind of one-stop shop. Um, and Dumont himself was an engineer. Uh, they engineered the, the largest cathode ray tube at the time, which I think it, like, they, people had to take out, you had to put it through a window. It wouldn't fit through a door, right? Because it was so gigantic. So they had large screen TV sets that weighed like an enormous amount. Um, so Dumont uh, uh, had, some, had some shows that met with, you know, decent audience numbers and they sold their stuff. But eventually they uh, went out of business with CBS, NBC, A uh, ABC taking over. And the big issue was they couldn't get enough local affiliates. So uh, is, is, is the concept of affiliation, uh, does, do, you, do you guys, that's something you talk about still, I guess, right? The notion that uh, the way the TV business is structured, the, the networks are production and distribution entities. The exhibitors, the local TV stations, are private businesses. And they affiliate with a network so uh, uh, and and for decades it was a license to print money I mean they just made so much money as local affiliates it was incredible so that's what we mean by affiliation it's a privately owned business maybe a company owns a number of television stations in different markets that would happen but they're very expensive uh, but um, you you would also see networks uh, outright owning some of the uh, some of the stations in in major markets, and that's been a trend that has expanded now to networks actually owning and operating their stations. But this idea of affiliate then is a, an independent private company that makes a deal with the network, uh, what they call a, a carriage agreement. So you sign on the line so that you are going to show everything that CBS sends you. You have certain hours out of the day where you're free to put local programming, usually news, maybe a little talk show or something that you work out. Or but, syndicated TV. Or syndicated TV, right? You fill it in with old reruns when you're not getting something from the network. But typically, you are showing everything the network gives you. Even if they give you something, you know, you happen to live in the South, people don't like that show about, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, in, you know, whatever, anything progressive, right? <laughs> you have to show it. You know, you have to show it anyway, which can lead to a lot of pressure on local stations. So um, that was, that was, that's called carriage, and you had to do that. Uh, clearance, right? Sorry, clearance is, is that you have to clear the whole, uh, the whole, the whole sh the lot of programming that they send you. I mean, you can imagine why the network saw it that way, because if they're selling advertising across the nation saying, you know, put your, put your ads on this program, and then some stations don't show it, 
it just becomes like a total chaos. You know, you, you need to have your whole set of affiliates doing that. Um, and station compensation, they actually, the networks used to actually pay the station uh, to, to be an affiliate, which has kind of turned around now with the networks asking the stations to pay them for their high-priced um, sports programming, stuff like that. So uh, things have changed, and we can get more into that uh, next class, I guess. Uh, network programming, um, if we, we can look at some of the Golden Age shows. Some of them are being you know, spun off again as like movies and stuff. There's still some currency to the intellectual property developed in that time. Um, most people have heard of Dragnet, stuff like that, but um, shall, shall we see it as a rebooted show someday? I'm not sure. Of course, the context of the 1950s, uh, the, the same types of pressure that were brought onto the movie industry with, uh, you know, the uh, sort of, uh, let's say, uh, Washington politicians realizing that they could burnish their conservative credentials by attacking commies in the entertainment industry. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the blacklisting was, has been better documented in, um, in the movie industry, you know, high profile screenwriters and directors who Chaplin was chased out of the country, uh, other screenwriters um, forced to go work in Europe or write under pseudonyms. Uh, so this, this was all a product of the 1950s. It also, uh, to a lesser extent, operated in the television industry. Um, there was, uh, there were certain publications that you could look in which actually would publish the names of uh, suspected communist sympathizers. And, uh, you know, anybody got a hold of that um, in, the, in the, ex the executives in the entertainment industry would basically just not hire those people. And it really was like a kind of, you know, a court where you had no recourse. It was just basically, you could lose your livelihood uh, and you'd never really have fair representation on a lot of this. Um, and of course, a big episode in the demise of McCarthy, Joe McCarthy was the um, uh, congressman who really had the highest profile conducting you know, hearings, the House Un-American Activities hearings kind of made him a star. Early television broadcasts of that it wasn't C-SPAN, but it was you know, broadcasts of, of, the, uh, of the hearings made him a bit of a star. Uh, but also a target of Edward R. Murrow, who was a very famous CBS reporter. He'd made his name in the Second World War broadcasting from, uh, from London live. Um, he continued to be a big shot. He had uh, See It Now as a new show on CBS. And uh, they, they, uh, we could see some of that maybe next week on you, uh, next class on YouTube as well. Uh, he, he, um, he did a, uh, an episode attacking McCarthy, basically exposing McCarthy's kind of uh, questionable claims and, and uh, dubious uh, uh, techniques. He played fast and loose with the truth. And McCarthy made the mistake of uh, taking up their invitation to film a rebuttal. So you can still see on YouTube McCarthy's rebuttal where he's practically foaming at the mouth. He's so freaking crazy. He just comes off terribly on TV. Uh, and, and that, in part, just, you know, was put the nails in his coffin in terms of losing his, you know, kind of political uh, mojo. And uh, so uh, um, Morrow was, uh, was sort of, he's well remembered for that, too. Uh, so let's, let's leave the cable uh, revolution till next class. Uh, but what we'll see is cable starts off as, you know, just a rebroadcaster of ordinary television. And... Uh, pretty soon is creating all those interesting things that we know it for. So uh, that is, you know, again, just a flash. And we should talk also about what's widely recognized as the, you know, the influence of uh, television on creating, um, you know, a souring public mood about the Vietnam War. In a sense, you know, there's a whole history to tell about that, which would be an interesting uh, uh, term paper eventually of uh, basically in the Vietnam War, um, the, uh, the, uh, the armed forces allowed journalists sort of unfiltered ac access to anything they could get to see, basically. They had light, portable film cameras. 
and they were basically, they could hitch a ride on a helicopter or whatever else and go to the front lines if they, if they were, you know, if they had the taste for danger. And the things that they filmed were sent back and shown on TV, you know, and it's the, whereas the Second World War government propaganda had pretty much, you know, regulated what the public could see. The Vietnam War uh, kind of opened a lot more gruesome images up to the public. And uh, that's uh, coverage on TV is credited for turning the country, at least encouraging the parts of the country that were against the war, gave them a lot of kind of visceral, emotional uh, imagery to, 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 to play off of, you know. So, uh, and we could see if you look at later conflicts, how much better it is, uh, how, much, how much better regulated the media is. There's a few documentaries um, that are pretty, pretty good at showing the whole system, you know. Okay. Uh, we can look at that maybe next class. 25 minutes to talk about um, our, uh, our quiz that's coming up next class. Um, so here are my review slides, which um, we're going to talk over here. Remember that what I'm showing you now is also available on the home page of our course, if you just look at it. So we can write this. There it is, okay. right? And this will, of course, go down before you can write this at home. Is that your, is that your question, JP? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I would prefer that people come in to write it, uh, but you could also write it uh, from home. It'll be online. So uh, um, I think uh, you'll have that option. Uh, but these PowerPoints will come down at that point. So as I said, these are. Uh, these are important, uh, important things that we could talk about, <laughs> right? So first of all, when it comes to uh, early inventors and radio, right? So the first radio medium was telegraphy, right? Remember, this is all going to be in a YouTube video that's up there. So I don't know if you need to actually photograph it because it'll be on your screen. Um, so there we go. Uh, before the exam, yeah. Just before the exam, I gotta leave it up for some time so you guys can study off it, right? So uh, Morse and Morse code—that's uh, the basis of telegraphy and uh, uh, what, of course, early broadcasting that that uh, got them thinking that hey, radio would actually be just a nice wireless uh, telegraph. I got you. Uh, looking through at the timeline again, what we identified was. Uh, the uh, incredible explosion of, uh, of, of inventions and stuff, especially when we get to uh, the digital era. So remember that there was that Moore's Law type of uh, um, um, idea that uh, uh, technological uh, change takes off at an exponential pace in, in digital culture. There's that. Uh, so the original forms of mass communication would have been books and newspapers, right? So when we talk about mass communication, remember we're talking about a one-to-many model where one publisher publishes a book or a newspaper and it can be read by millions of people. Uh, so that would have been the original mass communication form, but uh, radio also obviously is mass communication. One broadcaster can reach, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people in a local market. Um, one television station can reach hundreds of thousands of listeners and stuff. So that's, that's what we call mass communication when we talk about that. One of the most influential models of uh, communication are Shannon, the Shannon and Weaver mathematical model. So you remember that's where we have uh, basically an information source, a transmitter, a channel to carry the message. And we have a receiver, a technical receiver, and then the destination, the audience and such. So the noise source in there was, uh, when we talk about the mathematical model, uh, they created this model because they were engineers at Bell Labs. And what they wanted to do was to be able to calculate how much noise was going to be permissible within any communication chain. The more noise there was in the channel, the harder it would be for the receiver to decode the broadcast. And so they were basically engineers kind of calculate how bad can this be before 
you know, we reach the point of diminished returns. How bad can the cell phone sound be before we can no longer understand what people are talking about, that kind of thing. So, so um, it was a model, mathematical model for that. You could calculate noise within it. However, it just became a metaphor for you know, one model of communication where you'd have a sender and a channel and a receiver, basically. And, and that helps sometimes to, you know, just to model uh, how, how broadcasting works, certainly. But uh, when you get into our current, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, more interactive, many-to-many uh, -many type of electronic communication, the model is less useful, I guess. We talked about, um, you know, the influence of the regulator. So, uh, you know, we talked about the Radio Act and then how the Radio Act created the uh, Federal Radio Commission, which a few years later became the FCC. Federal Communications uh, Commission, uh, which is still in place. Um, so uh, the Federal Communications Commission, their mandate extends to broadcasting, but not to subscription-based electronic media, such as cable TV or anything happening on the internet. So we have a situation where the FCC uh, is, is clearly mandated to control content in radio and television as it's broadcast over the air. Uh, but not to control content in subscription-based electronic media on cable TV and such. Um, in, uh, in the way that communication researchers have talked about media use, uh, again, I'm seeing addiction cropping up in some of the, in some of the essays as you interpret your own media use. Uh, another, another approach um, is to think about what kinds of effects media has on its audience. And a common way to break that down was into cognitive effects, emotional effects, behavioral effects. Uh, so cognitive effects would, uh, for instance, be that you could learn something when watching a television show. An emotional effect would, you know, you'd be stirred up emotionally, you'd be sad, happy. And we, I did, in, in some of your media use uh, diaries, uh, papers, I was hearing, you know, about basically, you know, how, how media can help you regulate emotions, can keep you from being bored, or can, you know, calm you down before a stressful class, or, and so on and so forth. So those would be emotional effects that people are identifying. Behavioral effects would be those habitual, you know, I said I wouldn't use my phone for a day, and it's like I kept on, you know, taking it, stuff like that. So behavioral effects, is, are, are, is the media actually getting you to do things at a different time, you know? Uh, uh, you know, take your shower earlier so that you're ready for, uh, for, for your favorite show, or, or, you know, something like that. So there's all, all, all those behavioral effects are, are of interest to researchers about, you know, we just care about what people do with media, and of course of interest to marketers who, you know, if, if it's gonna affect how well a show will do or how well something will sell, they wanna know it, right? So those are the, way, the way that we uh, categorize listening and viewing behavior, that one. All right, we also talked about how one can distinguish between different mass media. So one way that was important was in terms of the, the time, the temporal aspect of consuming it. Is it something that uh, you basically have to sit in front of the receiver and listen to it while it's broadcast, which would make it a synchronous medium. So when the show comes on at 9, everybody in that part of the country sits down and listens to it at 9 o'clock. That's a synchronous medium. Versus an asynchronous medium where you post it to YouTube and people can stream it whenever they want. So it, it, there isn't a kind of simultaneity between the broadcast or the posting, if you want, and the consumption, right? So that's how we could distinguish between, you know, listening to a radio broadcast or consuming it later on as a synchronous, as a, as a podcast or something like that, where you could just download it when you want. Yeah. So that's one way of distinguishing between mass media. All right, um, the word convergence, an important word. We have a certificate here in our department 
called the convergent media certificate. So we should, you know, <laughs> we figure it's pretty important, you know, and what we're talking about is the blurring of boundaries and platforms between different media. So that, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of evidence for this, uh, you know, uh, a particular intellectual property could be, uh, you know, present in one medium. Uh, you know, you could have Marvel, Marvel movies, feature movies. You could have Marvel television shows. You could have Marvel, Marvel comic books. You could have, you know, my God, it starts to all converge together, right? And which is uh, what the most powerful uh, franchises are, are basically doing now. Uh, you can see news kind of converging with entertainment into infotainment, you know, so there are other forms of convergence, right? I mean, these are kind of buzzwords, but we're seeing a lot of that. Um, so, you know, television shows appearing on YouTube alongside of user generated, you know, content stuff. The, the, the convergence is also happening between professionalized media and amateur or, you know, user generated content. So those used to be clear lines that, you know, nobody cared what your home movies looked like, but now it's like, man, you can, you can make millions of dollars on your home movies, basically, due to, you know, convergence. So it's an it's a important concept. Uh, okay, we talked about when we looked at that, um, when we looked at that uh, timeline and we saw all of those innovations bunched up at one end, you know, Moore's Law, the idea of accelerating change in the digital world, uh, things, things, you know, double at a, at a much higher pace. Wireless transmission. So on the technical level, we're looking at uh, what people contributed to radio. Remember Heinrich Hertz was the physicist who demonstrated the existence of radio waves. Remember that spark gap experiment where, you know, he could, he could create a, you know, a, pr a big spark with, uh, at an electrical generator and you could hold, you know, a conductive wire together so close and you could see a tiny little spark jump across there and basically what you're doing is you're creating disturbances in the electromagnetic field which are so powerful they cross over and a little spark jumps over here as well. So that was a demonstration that radio waves actually existed. Uh, Marconi uh, could do a practical demonstration so with his device he could send messages over a longer and longer uh, um, uh, distance. Um, tuning eventually came in so he could actually tune to a particular band and send messages that way. Important. Uh, Fessenden uh, doing voice and music. So Marconi only had Morse code, right? But Fessenden was able to do an audio broadcast and then DeForest with the Audion tube, remember? So the Audion amplified those weak radio signals. The rationale behind why the FCC is, um, you know, accepted as intervening in broadcasting versus not intervening in subscription-based media. The idea here was the airways belong to the people. So it's a public good, like the waterways or the land. And for that reason, the government should have some authority over it a scarce resource. There's only a certain amount of spectrum out there. Um, so that is the basis for why the FCC should be able to regulate uh, what goes on in the radio and television industries. When you get to a closed system of cable transmission or of the internet, the idea there is that, uh, well, that's different. That's not like a public space. It's not a public good. Uh, you know, a company has created this and sells you a subscription to it. So uh, the FCC should, should leave that form of communication to the relationship between the company and the buyer, you know. Uh, no need to regulate that. So, of course, uh, outright obscenity falls under different rules. The FCC doesn't actually regulate that. That's a criminal issue if you're, um, you know, putting out child pornography or something. The FCC doesn't, doesn't uh, fine you. You know, the FBI comes and <laughs> grabs you. Okay. Um, all right, so we're back into, this, this jumps around, doesn't it? We're back into early radio, radio becoming a mass medium. So remember 
that the initial idea based on telegraphy was that radio would be a wireless telegraph. So we would use it in order to send messages to each other and you know, ships could send messages to shore and AT&T saw the possibility of a whole industry of people sending, you know, the equivalent of wires or cables. You know, they called it a cable anyway, right? Because it was sent across the telegraph, but they'd, they'd send a message uh, you know, over over the radio waves, so that more people could get it. But Sarnoff, among among others, but Sarnoff successfully, you know, turned himself into a celebrity, and and you know, and and stood on the top of RCA and NBC for 50 years. Uh, Sarnoff wrote an early thought piece uh, called the Radio Music Box Memo, which, if we weren't rushing through history all the time. We could have read a little bit of it, but basically what he says is, I envision a future where everybody has a music box in their home and it can play anything we want to put through it because it'll be receiving the, you know, the music through the, through the airwaves and stuff. So it was, you know, dreaming of a kind of ma mass media music delivery system, whereas most people in the business were thinking of it as the equivalent of a telegraph without wires, you know. So Sarnoff definitely had a vision early on. He was far from the only person. So that was the music box memo. Um, and then we noticed that another step towards early radio becoming a mass medium was to, you know, uh, sus <coughs> suspend all the competition over patents for a little while. Uh, when in the First World War, the government basically took all the patents to itself and said, okay, we're just going to produce the best possible radio systems and we're not going to worry that we can't put somebody's widget in there because we don't have a license for it. Okay, we're going to say, let's just do this. And so consequently, some of the barriers towards developing radio were taken away because you could just make the best possible technology for a while. So. So that helped radio a lot. As we said in the 20s, when radio starts to take off as a mass medium, the big players in the American uh, broadcasting and, and electronics industries kind of divvied things up. So that uh, Westinghouse and RCA would market radio sets, and their basic goal was to sell as many radios as possible, right? They promoted programs to the extent that they needed to tell people, hey, you need a radio because there's these amazing things on the radio that you can get it for free, right? But their part of the business was really just sell as many radios as they possibly could. Uh, and of course, they would reach a point of saturation at some point where you know everyone who wanted a radio had already bought a radio. So then they had to think, well, what else can we do? You know, what else can we build and sell? You know. In the meantime, other players like AT&T had more hand in the content, uh, and, and uh, RCA created NBC, and CBS was born out of you know, um, some, some gramophone companies and stuff. So the broadcasters started that way. Um, so this idea about chain broadcasting, I'm sure you remember. So as they were coming to the realization that a good way of creating content for a good price would be for you know the pros in New York to produce the content and then distribute it to all kinds of different stations. When they were getting into that idea, um, early on they were doing something called chain broadcasting, which is if they had an, an event which would have a wide enough audience that could introduce, in, in, sorry, interest people in different um, different uh, what you call it cities and stuff then they could chain together radio stations across the country. Uh, and so those early one-offs, like we were talking about a Dempsey-Carpentier fight, for instance, uh, which was like high profile, you know, they were gonna, they were gonna fight each other. Uh, well, there was enough interest in many different cities that they could broadcast from there and AT&T would send the broadcast down the phone lines, long distance, to stations in different cities. And so that's what they called chain broadcasting. One station sends a signal to another by the phone. And uh, everyone would broadcast that, that show at the same time. So clearly that sounds like you know mass medium and it sounds like an early network. 
So if you do a few of those, you realize, whoa, man, there's an audience for this. If we can only get enough interesting content, we could link these up all the time. And that's when chain broadcasting becomes networks because they figure, okay, now we'll have affiliates and uh, we will start to produce that content and send it out to all those stations at once. So that's, that's where radio actually becomes a, a mass medium. So the network system uh, is happening in the 20, 1926 for NBC, right? And United Independent Broadcasters, which is collapses basically, but is the, the remnants of it are picked up by Paley with the Columbia Broadcasting System. So he bought like a, a, a record label, which would provide a lot of music. And he bought, you know, the remnants of those stations uh, so that he could have a network like that. And so that, that became CBS in 1927. So you had, a, you had NBC and CBS, and, and eventually NBC split, and ABC was created that way, out of the split. But that's not for uh, 15 years later, actually. Yeah. Um, cool. All right. Uh, <laughs> How did how did uh, um, how did broadcasting influence uh, politics? Well, we talked about FDR's fireside chats as an early way of reaching out to uh, to uh, um, an audience directly without passing through the filter or the gatekeepers of uh, of um, the, the the news media. Um, when they recognized that. Uh, radio and broadcasting could be very influential within elections. The fairness doctrine is basically this idea is that you've got to give equal time to different political candidates. So if you're selling commercials to Democrats, uh, you've got to sell it to Republicans at the same price. That's it. If you're airing political commentators with a conservative point of view, you had to air a liberal point of view immediately afterwards. In the 1980s, this was torn up and thrown away uh, because the idea was that basically there's enough media out there now that we don't have to force every, every news show, every channel to air both sides of, of, of an issue or to have you know, competing points of view out there. But prior to the 80s, the fairness doctrine actually operated. So you had to have, like again, when I was growing up, 60 Minutes was a new show that was actually on the air. And they had something called Point Counterpoint. Yeah. Which was basically they'd have, do you, did you see any of this? Yeah. This. You've heard about it, yeah. So, so they'd have you know, a liberal and a conservative, and they would debate. And the reason they had to do that, instead of just be Fox News and just have one point of view, or MSNBC and have the left point of view, is that they were obliged to have both points of view. So, so they would design programs to build that in, right? Seems quaint now, you know, because, and how much more money is made now by airing just one insanely partisan perspective, you know? That's the point, is really, it's like, it's big business. Jenny? Fairness doctrine is it not a subsidiary or coming out of the communications before? I think that's way early. I'd have to see, actually. Um, there's a whole, you know, I, again, I don't want to give misinformation. I'm not, I'm not that well versed in it, but we'll see. But that's that principle of equal opportunity. Um, how many more of these have we got? Mm, I better stop embroidering, but I think we're pretty close to the end. There's like 25 of these because there's 25 questions or a couple extra extra credit questions in there too. <laughs> what? So the red is going to be on the quiz? Yes, sir. Otherwise... Can you think that I would give you like all these slides to learn? <laughs> I'm surprised you weren't crying. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Joking. The Biltmore Agreement. So the Biltmore Agreement uh, was came out of uh, newspapers being afraid of uh, of uh, radio scooping them all the time. So the Biltmore Agreement. Well, what did what did the newspapers wouldn't allow uh, radios to use any of their reporting on the air? until they had an agreement sort of that uh, radio wouldn't, um, radio wouldn't uh, broadcast breaking news before the sales period of the evening newspapers was over, for instance. So it, it, it tried to establish like a kind of a window for when radio could do uh, news. 
but that didn't last for too long. Eventually, uh, the, the agreement broke down, radio started doing what it could do, and it, it actually had to go and get its own kind of news service because the, uh, the press news services like the Associated Press wouldn't actually sell to radio. They would, so eventually that changed too, and now AP provides news to radio and TV, for sure. Government support for the war effort. Uh, just again, in World War II, remember, the rollout of TV was uh, suspended so that they could make radar uh, equipment rather than, uh, than radios and television sets at that time. And remember also that uh, the war was good for radio because uh, newsprint was rationed and so newspapers couldn't uh, print as many editions as they want so their advertising revenue fell whereas radio uh, kept right on advertising and making money and stuff like that. So remember FM radio uh, <coughs> created in the 30s by Howard Armstrong, almost single-handedly, better sound quality. Uh, it took a long time to catch on, in part because of Sar Sarnoff's machinations and the idea that um, you know, people would invest in a television set before they would invest in a radio <coughs> which had better sound quality. But um, when television kind of took over the radio programming, uh, then uh, that was in the 1950s, right? When television came back in the 50s and uh, you had the uh, kind of boomer generation getting into rock and roll music. Uh, and uh, at that point, FM became more interesting, especially when sound quality of popular music gets better. AM radio doesn't sound as good as FM. And soon you've got FM stereo starting in the early 70s and you know, beautifully produced popular music, um, so it all fits together and FM radio starts getting uh, you know, uh, all the good music channels and stuff like that. And there's FM formatting, which we'll talk about as we get into programming, but FM formatting, you got easy listening stations, you got all a station for each of your programming types, that emerges out of that period. Uh, radio has a much better digital version that never actually took off. High definition radio using the IBOC inband on channel technology. It's existed in some European countries, it's all there is now. CD quality audio, no dropouts, uh, could be satellite delivered across the nation or it can be locally delivered for local stations. We never did it because the radio industry here is fragmented. You know, it's a bunch of small station groups that couldn't invest in that huge investment. Um, as radio struggles to remake itself again, um, uh, one of the things that uh, is emphasized, even the FCC actually encourages this, to uh, get more local character into radio broadcasts. Satellite systems, um, Internet radio, they don't have a geographic specificity. They, they go national, they go big. You won't hear about things that are happening on your you know, block or in your, in your area. Local radio can do that. And the FCC even considered creating some kinds of regulations about it, but the pushback from the radio stations was like you know, too much. It's like, what, you want us now to report on localism? Like every time we say, you know, that there's a baseball game at the high school down the street, who's going who's gonna to create those reports? Who's going to monitor that at the FCC? You guys are crazy. So they back down. But they, they have been interested in preserving localism. And if you think about it, you know, that would be great that we get more local music, local bands and stuff, more support. All right, uh, electronic scanning, we're into what we talked about today. Baird with the mechanical systems, we work in Farnsworth. These were the inventors of TV. Um, television stations initially networked. Those are the existing networks we started out. We talked today about what the network affiliate relationship is. And, oh my goodness, we should have talked about cable. Uh, so, well, Check out the red text. What could I tell you about cable? It started out as CATV, Cable TV. That's the, the acronym, so you should get that one easily. Uh, okay, the FCC wanted uh, to make sure that cable didn't do an end run around local stations. 
So they created what's called carriage rules, which was that if you're Comcast here in San Francisco, you must carry the ABC, NBC, CBS affiliates. Any major station in this geographic area has to be carried on the cable system. Those are called carriage rules. The reason for that is so that the cable system can't strike a deal with a CBS affiliate in Texas and show you CBS that way, and therefore cutting out the local CBS station from all the people who are getting it on cable TV. Does that make sense? So that's what they had to do, the must carry rule, the carriage rules. And finally, uh, uh, there's always been the, the kind of minority version of, yeah, we should use this great invention to actually teach people something. Um, and, 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 and an FCC chairman uh, in the 1960s uh, made a name for himself. I just heard him interviewed like, uh, on a podcast like uh, last, last month. Newton Minow, <laughs> a small fish if there ever was one in the vast wasteland of broadcasting, but he said, we have created a vast wasteland in which you can't learn anything. It's all entertainment and junk. And so he's still, that term, the vast wasteland, is, he's still remembered for that, as he argued that we should have a better educational television system. And in the 60s, of course, that's where the Corporation for Public Broadcasting was created and funded by Congress in order to promote programming for the public broadcasting system, which we still have today. And it's a real political football, you know, because the conservatives are always wanting to take the money away from it because it's too liberal, but that still exists. <laughs> All right, I went five minutes over time, but that is the end of the massive, so you can commit those to memory. Remember the video will be online until just before the quiz.